Rob, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Oh, I'm happy to do it. It's great then. to see you. It's great to see you thank as well. You, thank you. Rob, the 99-day lockout ended with a five-year collective bargaining agreement with the players, the fifth you've negotiated since 2001. You often say there's only one kind of loss in labor. That's no deal. If there's a deal, it's always a win. But the union and the players were convinced that back in 2016 that the owners won that deal. Who won this deal? Look, I don't think there was a, a, a one side that won. The fans won the deal um, at the end of the day. Uh, we made an agreement. It allowed us to play 162 games. We didn't lose anything. Um, I think there's a lot of provisions in the deal that are actually good for fans. I think the rule change provision um, will give fans benefit in terms of the quality of the product they see on the field. I think other things like the balanced schedule agreement, um, huge for fans. It'll give them more variety in their opponents and it will allow people in cities to see great players that they have not had an opportunity to see in the past. Are there any aspects of the new CBA that you and some owners don't like? Oh, of course there are. I mean, I mean, of course. Uh, you know, every deal is a compromise uh, on topics. I mean, I know. I mean, it, it's been well publicized. I had owners that would have liked the CBT numbers to be different than, than they turned out to be. Um, and I'm sure there's things the, the players don't like, but I think at the end of the day, um, it took too long probably, um, it was a little unsightly, uh, but the parties compromised and reached an agreement that I think is going to be good for the game over the long haul. How close were you to losing games? Oh, way closer than was comfortable. Um, you know, when I, I actually left the office on a Wednesday night, um, having canceled the second set of games, um, and if something hadn't happened that night or very early the next morning, we would have lost games. I mean, it was over. I, there was just not enough room in the schedule if it had gone on even another two or three days um, to make up things like interleague series where you don't have a lot of flexibility. It, it just had run out of days. Rob, Major League Baseball players' median salary is now $1.2 million. It's below the $1.4 million in 2019 and the record of $1.65 million in 2015, seven years ago. Doesn't that say the owners have won the most recent CBA? You know, I, I, I think that those numbers um, are a reflection of changes that have taken place in the game. Uh, that really are independent of the collective bargaining agreement. Um, we have a much younger group of players today th than we had a few years ago. Um, clubs value players differently. Um, you know, the very best players are more expensive, and for some clubs that means they have to put their rosters together differently and rely more on young players. So I, I, I don't see it that way. The lockout was extremely contentious, a sequel to a lot of public hostility between you and the players' union and the run-up to the pandemic shortened 60-game season in 2020. As you know, much of the criticism from players, agents, and fans was directed at you. And it often was personal. How do you react to that criticism, and how did it shape how you approached the most recent lockout and your job going forward? Well, um, I think about the criticism as something that comes with the job. Uh, I, I think that when fans are faced with a risk that they're not gonna have a game that they love and I love, um, you know, somebody has to get blamed. And I, I, I think that the natural person to blame is the commissioner, that, that's part of the role. Um, secondly, I do think some of the criticism uh, by players is tactical. Um, I, I think if you look back at the history of labor relations in baseball, you know, the MLBPA has been rough on, you know, whoever was leading the owners at a particular time. And, and I understand that, that, that again, it's part of that process, just like it's part of the job. Um, having said that, um, I want to have a good relationship with players. I think my career over the long haul has been marked by having good relationships with players. Um, I've been meeting with players um, since the agreement, and I hope that we will have lines of communication that will make that relationship better. You said the lockout was necessary and defensive. Why was that? 
Well, uh, you know, this is not just Rob Manfred. I mean, <laughs> I think this is sort of the accepted wisdom in, in, in professional sports. Um, I think that um, in labor relations, you often need um, something to motivate the parties to deal with the issues, to get to an agreement. Um, there's only really two choices, strike and lockout. Um, we learned painfully um, in 1994 that if you don't control the timing by using an off-season lockout, um, you can be struck at a point in time that results in a disaster, literally the loss of the World Series. Um, we felt the best time to apply pressure was during the off-season when we weren't playing anyways in the hope that we could get something done by opening day. And while I admit it, it was not pretty, not ideal. The fact of the matter is we got an agreement and we got a 162 game season. And for me, that means the strategy worked. As you announced the cancellation of the first week of the regular season in Jupiter, Florida, you were caught on camera smiling. It became this widely shared meme online with some fans asking, why is this man grinning as he's canceling games? What happened there? Well, I think it's in the category of no good deed goes unpunished. I, I, I really do. Um, I walked out. Um, it was a very windy day. There was a podium, and there were microphones and recorders that literally covered the entire top of the podium. I had papers. I had nowhere to put them down. And just as I got to the podium, this young man who was trying to do his job was coming up and he wanted to add one more microphone that was pretty large. And, and you know, be, what literally went through my head is don't make a face like you're annoyed at this poor guy who's trying to do his job. And I, I'll admit I was annoyed. Instead of making that face, I smiled at him to try to put him at ease and that was the smile that was caught on camera. Why didn't you put out a statement or deal with it in some public way? I think when you respond and get into responding to each individual criticism. Um, y you just make things worse. Um, you know, people had their say on the topic. Um, I know what happened, and I, I just don't feel compelled to respond to each and every um, comment that somebody makes, even if it happens to be factually inaccurate. And did you think it was fair, the portrayal of that? I, I, I don't worry about fair or not fair. I, look, I smiled. I did. I did it for a reason. I know why I did it, and I just can't worry about that. Yeah. Speaking of the criticism, there's a constant critical refrain about you on social media. One we saw repeatedly during the lockout that says, Rob Manfred hates baseball. It seems almost preposterous to ask this, but do you hate baseball? No, it's, it, it, it is the most ridiculous thing. Um, among some fairly ridiculous things that get said about me. Um, you, you know, the fact of the matter is I grew up in a sports family. Um, I was very fortunate to be exposed to all kinds of sports. Um, the, and the fact of the matter is uh, the one that had the most lasting impression on me was a visit to Yankee Stadium in 1968. It was the first game I ever saw live. I remember to this day how I felt walking into that stadium. Um, I, I loved that day and loved the game. Uh, I actually loved the game before I got there and even more um, when I left. We spent hours. Um, my dad was a huge Yankee fan. Uh, New York Yankee baseball was what we did on summer nights. I mean, it's just that simple. And, you know, the assertion that I hate the game it just does, that one does rub me the wrong way. I have to tell you the truth. And what do you attribute that perception to? Oh, I don't know. Um, you know, I think that when you're responsible for the business aspects of the game and you have to make decisions that, that people um, see as depriving them of the, the, the sport that they love so much, it, that's the kind of reaction th that people have. You're pretty thick-skinned, though, right? If you're not thick-skinned, you're not suited for this job. I mean, and, and it's, it's actually in a weird way, um, it's a good thing. I think that people pay a lot of attention, can be hypercritical, if not downright mean, 
But I see that as a reflection of how deeply they care about the game, which is a positive for the game. And it's, it, it's not me that matters at the end of the day. It's the game that matters. In late April, Rob, two teams with the lowest payrolls in baseball, the Orioles and the A's, played a game in Oakland. Perhaps not coincidentally, the paid attendance was 2,703. It's the lowest attendance for a game since 1980. Do you agree that baseball's economic system is broken as long as some team owners choose not to spend much money on payrolls as an easy way to maximize profits thanks to revenue share? Yeah, um, look, I, I, there's a lot in that question that I don't agree with. Um, what I do agree with is that um, one of the things that didn't get done in this last agreement. You asked me earlier about things people, you know, were disappointed in. Interestingly, I think that the failure to deal with low payroll clubs more effectively um, was a disappointment for the owners. Um, I think, you know, we put a minimum payroll on the table. Um, because, $100 million. Right. Because of the give and take of negotiations, um, you know, that proposal didn't move forward, didn't become part of the agreement. And I think there's lots and lots of owners who feel that um, a minimum payroll of that type would have been good for the game um, and necessary to deal with um, clubs that elect to go very low in terms of payroll. Prior to the lockout, players were as galvanized as ever, in part because of their view of you and your leadership. Arguably, fanned, those flames were fanned by union leadership. In 2020, during the pandemic, Max Scherzer and Trevor Bauer, among others, harshly criticized you and made it personal. What attempts had you made to reach out to players during the past five years? Well, I, I mean, I met with Trevor Bauer individually, in person, had a conversation with him. Um, met with Max individually in person in Washington, had, um, in uh, Florida, excuse me. Um, and, it, you know, I, I have made an effort um, to reach out to players. Um, again, you know, what players, particularly players who are deeply involved in the union, decide to say in the context of collective bargaining, I view as tactical. Um, I, I, I take their criticisms to heart. Um, I do the best I can to respond to them. And as I said to you before, have really redoubled my efforts to make sure that I have good lines of communication with a broader group of players. You tried last year to have some meetings with players to try to start a conversation about rule changes, but we're stymied in that effort. What happened? Well, it was actually a couple of years ago. Um, you know, we had been interested in um, trying to make some changes in order to make sure that we had the very best form of baseball out on the field. Um, I'm a huge believer that player input in that process is crucial um, to, to making good decisions about what should happen on really, really important topics. I mean, maybe the most important topics that we deal with. Um, unfortunately, um, our effort to get real player input um, was not particularly fruitful during the last um, agreement. And I think that was part of a decision, a strategic decision, and, and I want to be really clear about this, that the MLBPA has every right to make. I might have made it if I was sitting where they are, that you know, they wanted to hold those issues to be dealt with as part of the larger negotiations. They knew they were things we were interested in and you know, could be um, things that could be traded on for other topics that they were interested in. So I, I think that was a product of the upcoming negotiations and a strategic decision to hold those issues. Since the lockout ended, Rob, you've met with players from seven teams. What do you hope to accomplish with these meetings with the players? Um, really two simple things um, that, you know, the collective bargaining agreements behind us, um, I want them to know that my number one priority is to grow the game, which is to their benefit, their economic benefit and the most effective way to grow the game is to work together. Um, secondly, I want an open line of communication with the players so that um, things don't build up and become bigger issues that I have a better understanding about what they're thinking over the course of the agreement in the hope um, that the next time around um, our collective bargaining process is a little smoother. 
Are you pleased with how the meetings have gone? I, I am. I am. Rob, you said baseball players have the best deal among the four major sports leagues. You told me recently that baseball is the only league with no salary cap, the most guaranteed dollars, the best pension and health plan, and no franchise tags. But players didn't see it that way. Will they ever see it that way? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I think the reality is this. We have, for literally decades, offered players the opportunity to get into a system um, like exists in the other three major professional sports, and their preference has been to stay in the current framework. Um, when you get your preference, usually that is a source of satisfaction. Rob, you've had to manage more cheating scandals than any leader in major sports history. First as a top deputy during the steroids era and as commissioner of the electronic sign stealing by the Yankees, Red Sox, and of course the Astros that helped them win a World Series. And more recently, the pitcher's widespread use of sticky substances. Critics say you were slow to react to both those cheating trends. And of course the Yankees, we just found out this week, uh, were fined only $100,000 for uh, what they did in 2014 and 2015, and no Astros players got suspended. What do you say to the critics who say that you were slow to react to these scandals? I think there is a common thread um, in those various topics. Um, you know, steroids, um, the use of electronics and, and, and sign stealing, and, and, and the common thread is this. Um, when a new problem arises and you have rules that are not um, up to snuff in terms of dealing with this new problem, you have to manage that change. You have to alter the rules, you have to give people notice, you have to get people to buy into the idea that stricter penalties are going to be applied. Um, and when you do that, you end up with a system that works. Um, it may not always be as fast as people, the critics you refer to, um, uh, would like. But the fact of the matter is it gives you a durable system that, w that serves the sport well. I think our drug testing program is the quintessential example of that. Um, but I think the, the electronics issue is, is another one. It was a complicated issue. Um, the rules weren't clear. Enforcement was extraordinarily difficult when, when you think it all, all the way through. And I think we have a system now where um, the electronics are not a force in the game um, and the, the behavior that was inappropriate has been stopped. What specifically was difficult about the enforcement of well, the electronics? It, it, I'll give you one great example. Um, it's easy to say um, you can't use, just make a rule, you can't use an electronic device to steal signs. Um, okay, so the last time I thought about it, a television set is an electronic device. If I take a television set and look at last night's game and decipher the signs by going through them, you know, in a very rigorous way, arguably a violation of the use of electronic devices. And how are you ever going to enforce that? That's an unenforceable rule. Right. And if you had moved more quickly on the electronic sign stealing scandal in 2014 and 2015, when the Yankees were first caught doing it, mm -hmm. could it have affected the outcome of a World Series by putting the Astros on notice? Look, I think the um, answer to that question is really temporal. Uh, the Astros were on notice. Um, right? I mean, we had issued um, a, a set of regulations saying not only clarifying what exactly was not allowed, uh, but also indicating that the penalties that were going to be uh, applied were going to be dramatically different than what had been applied to the these types of violations in the past. What decision are you most proud of as Commissioner, Rob? <sighs> I think, um, you know, decisions is su such, a tough, um, uh, such a tough word. I think the thing um, that I'm proudest of is that we kept um, our streak alive in terms of not losing games. I mean, when I came to baseball in 1998, um, came in house, uh, my principal goal was to break the series of negotiations, every one of which had resulted in some type of loss of games. 
and um, we managed to, to do the first agreement without losing games in 01. And, um, you know, we had a couple that were really nice. They got done in the fall and it was smooth and nobody knew um, that there was even an, an issue. Um, this one was obviously more of a struggle, but we kept the streak alive and I think that's the most important thing for the fans. Rob, I know you were on the outside looking in in 94, but how searing was the experience from your standpoint of watching a World Series get canceled? Oh, it was one of the worst things um, in my professional life. Um, it, you know, I'm even then, I was extremely um, close to Commissioner Seelig. Um, I watched the toll that it took on him um, in, in terms of having to cancel the World Series. Um, I was painfully aware of what it did to our fans. And if I had missed that point, um, the next couple of years, in terms of how the game performed, that message was really driven home very, very clearly. Um, it was a terrible chapter for baseball. And how much did that experience shape the way you approach the future negotiations starting in 2001 when you were? I learned um, a tremendous amount in the 1994 negotiations. Um, I watched some good things that, it, that were done, and I watched some mistakes that were made. Um, and it actually, that experience ultimately um, altered the course of my professional career. Rob, what's the biggest mistake you've made as commissioner? What's the one, what's the one decision you'd like to have back? I have to narrow it down to one. <laughs> um, you know, I think people who can't admit they've made mistakes, particularly in a job like this, are a little dangerous. But um, I think the biggest mistake I've made, um, probably because it's the area where, you know, I had the most experience, was getting into a public back and forth um, in the run-up to the, the 2020 season. Um, you know, I had done multiple negotiations. One of the things I'd learned in 1994, the publicity and negotiations was not a productive um, undertaking. And despite the fact that I knew it and I had conducted a number of negotiations quietly for that very reason, um, I let myself be drawn into public engagement and, and I do regret it. And what motivated that? Um, I think that, um, when you're a labor guy, and I, I do think I mean, that's what I did for years. Um, one of the things that's really important is when you make an agreement, you kind of stand by the agreement. And I felt, correctly or incorrectly, that the first agreement we had made in April of 2020 was being mischaracterized publicly into the players. You have also told me, Rob, that you regret saying the World Series trophy was a piece of metal. What, what, what happened there? You know, um, I do regret it. Um, you know, I regret it because it's disrespectful to the game. And, and, you know, I love the game. I, I would never want to do it. I, I, I regret it um, for that reason. I also regret it because I was being defensive about something I, I, I've decided. I think as I've matured um, in the job um, that I've come to realize that you have to make your decisions articulate why you did what you did, which I'd already done with the Astros. And then after that, it, it, trying to defend it is the wrong approach. You just gotta let people make their minds up as to whether they think you got it right or got it wrong. Um, you arguably have the toughest job of any American sports commissioner. You're shepherding a game with a story passed into an uncertain future. You're balancing the interests of big market and small market owners while making changes in rules that often offend diehard fans. What frustrates you the most about the balancing act that you have to perform there with, with, with you know, old school fans and yet bringing the game into the future? I think the dynamic surrounding change in baseball is really frustrating. And wh what do I mean when I use that word dynamic? It seems um, that whatever change you put out there there is a almost um, knee-jerk, natural, negative reaction to it. Um, and then when people see it, um, they, real, they, you know, they get an opportunity to see it real life as part of the game that they love, right? Um, the, the reaction becomes more positive. And we've seen this over and over again. And I, I think that 
um, that initial knee-jerk reaction is a real impediment to change because not everybody wants to live through that first reaction in order to get to a change that, that, that might be good for the game. What's a good example of that? Well, I think, you know, I'll give you just a, a, a little example, you know, the extra inning rule. Um, we went to the extra inning rule after we had seen it um, in the WBC. We knew how it worked. It actually had produced, if you go back and look at those WBC games, there were some great ends to those games, a number of which I was at. Um, and then we actually implemented it in the big leagues as part of the pandemic um, uh, response in order to limit the time that players were on the field. But once it was out there, I, I mean, a, and people started to see it, even some of our more, most traditional writers said, hey, there's actually advantages to this. You know, we're not seeing players who aren't pitchers pitching. Um, we're reducing the prospect of player injury by not keeping them out on the field for, for 18 innings. And in terms of the entertainment value of the product, you do kind of get to that, you know, there's a point in the game where we know it's going to get decided. So that's a great example of it, I think. Rob, you spent nearly 35 years working for Major League Baseball, seven years now as baseball's 10th commissioner. You've quoted Theo Epstein that your obligation to fans is to provide the best form of baseball, and that includes more action in the game. Mm -hmm. How can that be accomplished? Oh, I think there's a variety of things that you could do. Um, I, and I, I want to just give you a caveat here. You know, we have this new competition committee that I think is going to provide us a much better vehicle for player input into the changes that are going to take place in the game. And that's really important to me. So while I have some ideas, all of them are subject to what's going to happen in this competition committee. Um, you know, I think um, one that we're seeing right now, live and in person, you know, we have the pitch clock, um, the current iteration of those rules throughout the minor leagues. The reaction to that has been overwhelmingly positive in terms of what it does for the game. The game's shorter. Um, there's more action in the game. Um, those are the kinds of changes that I think could be very helpful. Are we going to see that more likely than not next year, a, a pitch clock in Major League Baseball? Uh, as well as the elimination of the shift. Again, um, uh, uh, compound questions. I am a lawyer. I'm going to take the pitch okay. clock. Um, Fair um, um, <laughs> but um, the, 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 you know, subject to the competition committee process, it could change in that process. I think there is a, I think the pitch clock's a good thing. I think there's a lot of support for the pitch clock in the game. I think fortunately, a lot of players have experience with playing under the pitch clock. And maybe the best thing about what's going on in the minor leagues is how quickly players have adjusted to that rule. Rob, we've talked about this before. I ask you often about the Manfred Doctrine, meaning a list of your hopes for the future of the game. What, what are they? Well, I think if I had to give you one line, um, I hope that um, we undertake initiatives that result in baseball being passed down to the next generation um, the way it was passed down to our generation. I truly believe um, that baseball is unique among the professional sports. It's not the biggest, it may not even be the most popular, but it has a unique place in our culture. And I think um, what I would like to do is make decisions that preserves that unique spot in the culture. And what kind of decisions well, are you thinking? I think about? I'll give you a variety of things. I think number one, um, we have invested heavily in youth participation. Um, I think play in the sport is crucial um, in terms of developing fandom. As a subset of that, we have had a special focus on playing opportunities in underserved areas. I believe for baseball to maintain its cultural role, um, what people see on the field has to look like American society. We need to look, work really, really hard um, on that topic. Um, secondly, um, the issue we just discussed, um, nothing, nothing can stay the same um, while the world around it changes. Our game um, has to respond to organic developments that have occurred in order to make sure that we continue to provide our fans with the very best form of baseball, the very best entertainment that we can provide out there. 
This season, Rob, there's a universal designated hitter rule for the first time. Pitchers can't use the sticky stuff, and yet offense is on pace to hit a historic season low. Strikeouts are up, home runs are down, the league-wide batting average is only 232, and the pace of play continues to be maddeningly slow. Three hours and six minutes we're at right now. I think that's only four minutes quicker than the record that was set last year at three hours and 10 minutes. What can be done to change that? Oh, I think there are rules. Um, well, first of all, looking at offense in April is not a good plan, right? I mean, it's cold and, you, you know, our offense will pick up this year. I'm 100% sure of that prediction. It always does. Um, having said that, look, there are issues in the game. I believe that there are um, responses, um, rule changes that can be made that will address those changes. Um, we've talked about some of them. I think one we have not talked about, and it gets back to the topic of youth participation, um, some of the things we're seeing at the big leagues actually begin with the way the game is being coached and taught to young people. And we are very active in that youth space in an effort to address these trends over the long haul. What's an example of well, that? Well, just, you know, throwing at maximum velocity if you're a pitcher as opposed to the kind of pitching that you used to see. The, you know, swing for the fences kind of approach for batters as opposed to valuing um, other kinds of offensive production. Is it fair to say, Rob, that in some of the rules changes that are going to be put forth and are likely going to happen next year, that it's an attempt to bring the game back to what it used to be? Uh, yeah. More, more, more play, more excitement, more stolen bases, you know, more doubles and triples, not just swinging for the fences and strikeouts. I think about it this way, Don. Um, I, I think that um, if you look at how the game looked, pick your year, okay, um, there has been organic changes driven largely by individual GM decisions as to how you might win one, one or two more games, which is, that's what they're supposed to be doing. I'm not being critical. That's their job, okay? I think our job um, is to look at how those individual decisions have accumulated and altered the game, okay? Decide what the best form of the game is and then come up with rules that move us back um, to a game that was shorter, more action-filled, less dependent on the home run, less dependent on the strikeout. Is it a true, Rob, or is it fair to say that trying to make the game shorter is an acknowledgement that the game right now, for some casual fans, is too slow and too dull? Yeah, here, here's the problem. Um, when you acknowledge there's something wrong with the game, that turns you into a hater of baseball. <laughs> and, and, and it's a continuum, right? Um, it, you know, I think everyone who's working on this project, me, the owners, the players, we all love the game. We just want to make sure that we're putting our best foot forward in terms of competing in an entertainment um, environment that's really competitive with lots of alternatives. And shorter attention spans. Absolutely. A pitch clock is shaved off about 25 minutes from minor league games to an average of about two hours, 40 minutes this season. Is there an ideal average time of a game in your view? You know, I, I really don't have an ideal time. I, I think the interesting thing about what's happening with the pitch clock is the time's great. It's shorter. I think everybody agrees shorter's better. Um, it is the other changes that people are seeing in the way the game's being played. I'll give you an example. You have to pitch quicker. Your ability to go all out on every pitch is reduced. That produces more offense, different kind of offense maybe. And, you know, it's, I think those are all positives. Rob, I spoke to several owners who seem as impatient about the game's slow pace of play as you are. Some owners say privately they would even be open to seven inning games. Would you go that far? I'm not a seven inning game guy. Uh, I, I really am not. I, I, think, um, I think our fans pay for, are used to, and want nine innings of baseball. And, um, you know, I think that's someplace we're going to stay. But you've heard that. I years. have. Yeah. I, look, I, yeah. I, I have. I think it is a reflection. Um, it, you know, this is not a Rob Manfred crusade <laughs> in terms of the game. Um, my views, I believe, are in general reflective of how owners see the game 
how they see their fans reacting to the game, how our research says our fans are, are reacting to the game. These are not personal views. They are, you know, um, research-driven um, views that any business would have to pay attention to. Rob, fans complain about bad umpiring constantly. Uh, Angel Hernandez is public enemy number one. Uh, but at the same time, technology for robo umpires continues to improve. Can you foresee a time when the strike zone is called by technology and not umpires? I can. Um, I, I, we have um, a, an automated strike zone system um, that works. I mean, it's absolutely clear um, that it works. I think that um, it can be deployed in different ways that could improve the game. As a matter of fact, we're using it two different ways this year in the minor leagues. Um, one way, the umpire has an earpiece. Every pitch is called by the system and the umpire just makes the call that comes through the earpiece. Um, second system, less of a change, and you know, we're always looking for incremental movement, is a challenge type system where you know, certain, certain pitches could be um, uh, called. I think- um, Managers have three challenges. Challenges, yeah, I, I, exactly, exactly. Um, I think that there's an educational process that needs to, to go on here. I think that the, we need to make sure that the players understand how refined this system is. Um, you know, what, what's the plane where the ball or strike is getting called? Where in relation to the plate? What is it doing about hitters of different sizes? How does it adjust? All that education needs to take place before I think we'll get buy-in from the players and be able to move forward. But looking into your crystal ball, do you believe we will have a robo-ump system of some kind in the future of MLB? I do. I do. Any timetable prediction? I, I just can't. Um, on that one. I, we, we do have an educational process we need to go through with the players so that they make sh we, we make sure they understand how sophisticated this system is and how accurate it is. Rob, you mentioned this earlier, uh, how important youth baseball is to you. Um, and you've made a major investment in, in that, which I don't think a lot of people are aware of. How important is the youth baseball initiative to the game's future? Oh, it's, it's absolutely critical. The number one determinant of whether somebody is a fan as an adult is whether they played as a kid. And, it, you know, the really interesting thing is I, I'm a great example of this, right? I was a huge fan. I only played through Little League. I never played after I was 12 years old. You know, I, I played Farm League, what we called Farm League and Little League. Um, I was terrible. Um, loved it. Um, and became a fan for life. And, and I think that's a great example. You do not need to be a high school player in order to build that fandom. Um, and there is no substitute for participation um, in, in terms of building fandom. You know, equally important, you know, we have the great, great athletes, right? You only find great athletes like the ones that are playing in Major League Baseball now, if you start with a really big base and have it narrow down to that elite level and, you know, for our product to be compelling, we need that big base. Rob, as you know, baseball has struck multiple sponsorship deals with gambling companies. Odds are now embedded in MLB broadcasts. Has baseball's embrace of gambling increased fans' interests, engagement, and TV ratings in the way you, the owners, and your broadcast partners expected? You know, I think it's early in that process, but certainly the early returns are that um, sports betting uh, is a way to increase fan engagement and increases the amount of time that people stay with a broadcast, um, and, which is not shocking. It's just a, it's a second screen experience. Second screen experiences generally prolong uh, the viewer's attention to, to the primary screen, and I think that's what we're seeing. Speaking of gambling on baseball, baseball's all-time hit king, Pete Rose, just turned 81 years old. And as you know, Rob, more than two years ago, he applied for reinstatement. He argued that because you leveled no punishment against Astros players for electronic sign stealing, he should be taken off baseball's ineligible list. I think his lawyer said there cannot be one set of rules for Mr. Rose and another for everyone else. In light of those arguments and baseball's all-in embrace of gambling, 
Have you made any determination or decision about whether Pete Rose should be removed from MLBs and eligible? Well, first and most important, I have not made a decision with respect to the petition for reinstatement. And I want to be clear, this, you know, I've been commissioner seven years. This is my second go around. I've, I've dealt with one petition At for the end of 2015. Right, for reinstatement already. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to get into um, an evaluation of the arguments that have been made. The one thing that I think it's important to bear in mind, um, Rule 21, the gambling prohibition, is regarded to be the most important rule in baseball. And it's regarded to be the most important rule in baseball because it is the bedrock of ensuring that our fans see fair, all-out competition unaffected by any outside forces on the field. Do you have a, any intention of meeting with Pete Rose to hear from him directly about his uh, petition for reinstatement? Pete will be given an opportunity to come in and be heard if that's what he wants to do before I make a decision. So you will, you will do I that? I will meet with him, yeah. Okay. During the lockout, you said owners could have made more in the stock market than the resale value of their clubs, but team valuations have increased about 400% in the past decade. Do you still believe that? Yeah, I mean, I, I was looking, I made that statement um, based on a data set of the m most recent sales over the last five years. And, you know, you can cut data up a, a variety of ways, but most people, most people don't have an investment horizon that goes on over two decades. They look at a shorter period of time. Over that shorter period of time, the statement I made was accurate. Rob, this season baseball can be watched on NBC, ABC, Fox, ESPN, TBS, Peacock, Apple Plus, YouTube, MLB TV. Am I forgetting one? <laughs> I think you got them all. <laughs> I think you got them all. Some fans are complaining that it costs too much or it's too difficult to access the games they want. And, of course, MLB's blackout rules have annoyed fans forever. What can be done about that? Look, our number one priority, business priority right now, is reach. Um, some of the deals that, that um, you reference, um, we probably would not have done um, were it not for the fact that we're in the process of responding uh, to a change in the media landscape, the erosion of the RSNs, and the need to find an alternative to, to, to reach fans if those RSNs continue to decline. Um, I, I believe over the next few years, um, our number one goal should be to increase reach and increase reach by getting to a more national product where fans can see what they want to see no matter where they're located. And what can be done about the blackout rule? Is well, there I any think, leeway there? Uh, no, well, I think that the, the, there is, of course, leeway. Uh, it, it is not a quick or easy process because those blackout rules come about as a result of contractual arrangements between individual teams, RSNs, and distributors. And you have to find a way to work your way through th that contractual labyrinth to free yourself from the blackouts. Believe me, we hate blackouts as much as fans do, and it is the number one email topic that I get from fans. And it's become worse as the distribution of the RSNs has gone down because more people find themselves in that block where um, the RSN has exclusivity and there isn't a distributor that's showing the games. Rob, I want to talk to you about uh, the, the first month of this season. We've seen 19 Mets players hit by pitches, uh, by far the most in Major League Baseball so far. What's your reaction to that? What is, what is happening here? Every time that a player gets hit by a pitch, um, it's the source of concern to us because, I mean, people throw really hard now and you, you can end up with injuries that are just so serious. So hit by pitch is a big deal for us um, from, from a safety uh, perspective. The Mets numbers are out of line with the, the numbers in the rest of the sport. 
Um, we're in the process of having conversations with the Mets. Um, we're going to have some conversations with Mets players about the reason for it. The one thing I will say, the baseball we're using is the same baseball we use across baseball. So it's hard to blame what's going on, on on the baseball. There has to be other factors at work here that accounts for the Mets data being so out of line with the rest of the league. Do you have any theories on what, what it's about? Uh, you know, we've, we're looking at a variety of var variables. I'd be guessing. I mean, there's all sorts of things. Where, you know, a particular team's players stand in relation to the plate can be an issue. Temperature can be an issue. How many cold games, you know, New York does tend to be colder than some places. We're just trying to figure it out right now. Rob, what's your reaction to the constant refrain among some that there have been too many different variations in the baseballs, and now we have the humidor rules, and what, what do you have to say about that? Well, you have to begin with the basics. Our baseball is a handmade product. There is always going to be variation baseball to baseball because it's natural materials and it's made by hand. Number one. Number two, across every season since 1998, every baseball that's been used in Major League Baseball falls within the specifications that we give to Rawlings. Every single ball. Um, now, have there been changes? Yes, the fact of the matter is all the changes that we've been made have been based on input from scientists and experts all designed to make sure not only are the balls within specification, but that they fall closer to the center of those specifications so they are more uniform. And did the pandemic affect the variation in the balls too, the production of the balls during the pandemic? In one season. Um, we had, um, in the 2021 season, we were unable to produce enough quote unquote 2021 balls. So we had to use some, we mixed in older inventory, 2020 And inventory. there's been criticism of that, but was there any way to get around it? We just didn't have people in factories to produce enough balls. We made the only choice um, that was available to us. We had to use balls manufactured in two different years. You know, you could have gone all 2020 and then switch to 21, we thought the better thing to do was to mix them and get as close to a uniform mix as possible. Rob, you are 63 years old. Your current contract expires after the 2024 season. Do you hope to continue to serve as commissioner beyond that season? I really haven't made a decision um, a, a, about what I'm going to do, um, whether I want to continue. I'll be 60 seven, I guess, 66 or 67 when I'm done um, with this term. And, um, it, you know, I love the job, um, but I haven't really made a decision about what's next. What do you hope your legacy will be as commissioner? Well, I hope that um, I leave behind um, for who's ever next a better relationship between owners and players, between the commissioner's office and the players. Um, you know, it's the principal reason that I came to baseball. I think we made real strides on that issue, um, you know, prior to the time that I was elected. And I want to make sure that we get back at least to where we were, if not even better. Um, I hope that uh, because of our efforts in the youth space, um, that baseball will stay. We have regained our spot as the number one youth participation sport in that under 12 group. I think that's a hugely important group for us. Um, I want to make sure we stay there. Um, I hope um, that we will leave our fans um, a product on the field that is the absolute best form uh, of baseball. And I hope that we continue to be a late leader in the technology space. I think that um, in a sport that everyone associates with tradition, I think some of the things that we have done um, on the technology side of the business uh, provides a nice counterweight to that you know, perception of being traditional. Expansion. What is your view of expansion? Are we going to see 32 teams? I would love to get to 32 teams. I think it opens up opportunities for us in terms of realignment. Um, it, scheduling, you know, fours work a lot better than fives. Um, my friend, now 
go on, Dave Montgomery I, I, I used to tell me all the time, just remember, Rob, fours are better than fives in the schedule. You know, you got to get there. So, yeah, I would like to get there. And I think there are cities that would like to have Major League Baseball, and we ought to meet that need. What are the top cities you think, Bob? I'm not going to get into top <laughs> cities because it sets off a variety. I'm not doing that okay. one. <laughs> All right. And, and how, what will be the uh, price point for entry? Oh, into I, MLB. Uh, look, I, you know, we have not had that conversation internally, but, um, y y you know, um, the price point for entry is obviously influenced by franchise values and um, the diminution of central revenues that takes place by having to divide it 32 ways instead of 30. So there's some math surrounding that. It, I'm going to ask you to look in your crystal ball again. What do you predict your legacy will be? Oh. I'm not doing that one. Well, <laughs> no, I well, haven't balked yet, but I'm not doing not that one. Not going to do that one. Well, you had told me, Rob, that some fans will say, oh, my God, that crazy guy in New York is at it again. He's tinkering with our game. That's going to be on my tombstone. He tinkered with the game until they got rid of him. I think you were saying it a little half kiddingly when you told me yeah, that. But, I, it but, but, sounds but, like half kidding. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I don't. I, I mean... You know, look, it kind of goes along with um, accepting the fact that criticism is part of the job. I, that what people are going to say at the end, um, not my thing. <laughs> it's just really not my thing. I just don't know how to answer the question. Rob, hey, uh, great to see you. Good to see you, too. Thanks so much for doing this. Happy to do it. Yeah. Good to see you again. <laughs> You said the harsh criticism that was leveled against you by players before and during the lockout was tactical. But you've now been meeting with teams and meeting with players, nearly half of the teams. What are you trying to accomplish? I'm trying to open a dialogue um, with the players uh, to try to get a feeling for um, how we can work better together to grow the game, to make the game everything it can possibly be. And what exactly are the players telling you in these sessions about the rules changes that are coming? Well, you know, we've had a very positive back and forth about the rule changes um, in particular, but a variety of topics, but rule changes in particular. Um, it is not a consistent message from players. Not every player thinks the same thing about every rule change. Um, but I think the dialogue will be helpful over the long haul. How open do the players appear to be to you about the pitch clock? I think that um, there are concerns about the pitch clock. I think a lot of those concerns can be addressed with education about how it actually works um, by getting videos of games out there so they can see how it works. Um, here's the real point. I'm very interested in player input on the rule changes. But we also have great input from our fans about the way that the game's being played on the field. Um, we have to find something that the players are in support of to address those fan concerns. And do fans say that they want a pitch clock? Fans are interested in a game that moves more crisply and has more action in it. And our experience with the pitch clock in the minor leagues is it's useful in that regard. Rob, what is your assessment of the quality of umpiring so far this season? Look, I think our umpires across the entire group do an outstanding job um, on a very difficult task. I mean, calling balls and strikes is a really, really difficult job. Um, and, you know, there's always going to be criticism, but I think um, we have a great staff that on balance does a really good job. If you had to give the umpires a letter grade, what would it be? Uh, I, I don't give my other employees letter grades, and I'm not doing it for the umpires. Fair enough. If robo-umpires are introduced as early as 2024, something that we've discussed as a possibility, should fans see that as an indictment on the quality of umpiring? I don't think so at all. I think fans should see it as baseball's efforts to embrace technology and make sure that the calls on the field are as accurate as possible. I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball. All right, let's look at opening day 2023. I'm going to mention various rule changes. Tell me what you think the likelihood or whether you want them to occur, a pitch clock. Um, I think that 
uh, a pitch clock is quite likely for 2023. We were really transparent um, about our desire to have the pitch clock with the MLBPA during the negotiations. I don't think it's a surprise to them that we're very interested in it. And the opposition to the pitch clock among some veteran pitchers, I know you're aware of that. Some of them are quite vocal about it on social media. How much does that concern you? It, it, it concerns me. We're interested in player input, but again, I'm hopeful that with some education and additional detail about how it's going to operate, we'll be able to, to get past that opposition. Okay. Opening day 2023, the elimination of the shift. How likely is that? Um, hard for me to put a percentage on that. I think that's one that needs real discussion in the new competition committee. Really? So you don't feel it's necessarily there yet? Uh, you know, I don't want to prejudge the competition committee process. I, I, I really don't. Um, I think that um, elimination of the shift is a low-risk undertaking for the sport in the sense that all you're doing is trying to put people back in the positions that they traditionally occupied. Uh, positioning on the field has hurt a particular class of players, and I think we have an obligation to discuss, particularly with the players, whether we should do something about that. How do you personally feel about I think the that shift the, elimination? I think that the elimination of the shift is a low-risk undertaking for the sport. Um, all it is is putting people in positions they traditionally occupied, and it could have a positive impact in terms of action on the field. And what, uh, what impact is that? I, I think that it will, would increase offense. 2024 opening day, robo umps. What's the likelihood? Just don't know at this point. Just really don't know. Um, I, I don't know whether we'll use it, and I don't know what form it's going to take. We've discussed this in the past. Some owners are in favor of seven inning games. You told us in our last sit down at City Field, you're not. But is there any likelihood down the road of that occurring in your view right now? Well. It depends on how long the road is, um, but I don't see that as a change that's certainly not high on my agenda, really for fan reasons. I think people want to see nine innings of baseball. The Oakland A's attendance is at historic lows. On May 2nd, 2,488 fans were in the ballpark. I think a player said he could hear a pin drop. Mm -hmm. How concerned are you about the low attendance figures in Oakland? Is there anything that can be done about it? I am concerned about it. Um, we, we obviously want our games to be fully attended. I think the Oakland situ situation is extraordinarily difficult. They're in a two-team market, which has always limited their revenue. They are in a facility that is substandard by anyone's measure um, and have been for a long time. They've been in a process that's gone on more than a decade in an effort to get a new stadium. And because that process has been so long, they've been forced really to explore uh, alternatives outside of Oakland. That's a toxic mix. Is there any solution? Yeah, I think the solution is to get a deal in Oakland. Um, I think that um, that would give them an opportunity to do everything uh, positive in, in, in that market. Um, and, you know, hopefully it, they'll be able to do that in some short term or they're going to have to continue with their exploration of alternatives. Rob, one of your star pitchers, Matt Harvey, uh, was not only taking prescription drugs, but actually was dealing them to other players. Does Major League Baseball have a prescription drug problem? Um, I don't believe that we do. Um, I think that, you know, we're very careful about how prescription drugs are handled uh, by our medical staffs in clubhouses. Um, you know, it, it is not something that I believe is widespread in the game, um, but certainly the, the disclosures um, that came about in the trial were, were troubling to us. Why was Trevor Bauer suspended for two years, Rob? I'm just not in a position to discuss the, the Bauer evidence in any detail. Um, the basic agreement prohibits that. Um, I, I, I will say this, we did a really long and really thorough investigation. Um, most of what we found in that investigation is not public, and we believe the evidence supports the decision that I made. I have a question for you about your love of the game. How many hours of baseball do you watch in a week? Oh, so let me count nights. <laughs> um, I would say that I probably watch in the evening um, 
at least four nights a week a game or games so there's 12 hours and I always have on in the office the MLB network games during the day so you know in excess of 20 hours and where do you watch those games um, well, what networks? I mean, do you watch multiple games? Do you surf around? Well, now we're going to get into <laughs> do I treat everybody equally. <laughs> um, during the day, it's easy. I watch the MLB network games because I like to see our own network. In the evenings, um, I tend to try to watch more than one game at a time, but I will confess I watch a lot of New York baseball, both Yankee and Met baseball. And when you watch baseball as a fan, what's your biggest aggravation? I think... Um, the same sort of sentiments that we hear from our fans in terms of pace of the game. They're too slow. Mm -hmm. More action. Yeah, I think that particularly, the, the, I think the pace issue, the action issue, is more acute in a broadcast than it is in the ballpark. Rob, we've talked a lot in this profile about how tough you are on yourself. And I don't think fans necessarily see that. They're very, very hard on you, but you're also very, very hard on yourself. And I don't think that's a side that fans necessarily see. Do you feel misunderstood by fans? Oh, I don't know um, what I think about that question, Don, to tell you the truth. I think that, um, like every human being, I would like people to have a positive impression of me and the job that I do. Uh, but I try not to worry about what people say too much because you get caught up in that and it affects your decision-making process. I try to deal with the issues that are in front of me on the merits without thinking about that side of the house. Rob, how do you grade your performance as a spokesman or even as an evangelist for baseball? I think that... Um, I have tried to be positive about our game. Um, I, you know, always refer to the game as the greatest game in the world because I believe that. Um, I think that with respect to spreading the word, I think our efforts in the youth space um, is putting our money where our mouth is. That is, get kids to play the game. We're going to have more fans going forward. Um, I think the tough spot is when you recognize, even if you love something, if you recognize that change needs to come and you talk about that, people take that as negativity. Um, I don't see it that way. I, I see it uh, from the perspective of I love the institution, I love the game, and I want it to be everything it can be. Some of your top uh, lieutenants here in MLB have said that they wish that you would get out even more than you do and talk about your love of the game. Is that something you're thinking of doing as these rules changes have to be sold, not just to players, but to fans? Um, look, I, I think it's important um, to be the face of the game in terms of positivity and articulating all that the game can be. Um, and, you know, it is a priority of mine going forward. How do you grade your performance in talking to the media? Setting me aside. But, 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 but generally in how you, how you speak with the media, the press conferences, and just how, you know, I know you're pretty self-critical. How, how do you judge your own performance in, in talking to the media? I think that um, I have tried and been successful uh, uh, in being factual in the things that um, I have said to the media. Uh, I think that sometimes the media is not as factual in their reaction um, to some of the things I say, but um, I think your fundamental obligation of the media is try to be honest and transparent, and I think I've been pretty good about that. Why do you think the media has not been factual? Well, I, I just think that sometimes, um, you know, when you say something, um, uh, uh, you know, you state an economic fact, you know, people say, well, that can't possibly be true. Well, oh, okay, well, maybe, maybe not. I, you know, I have sources of information they not, may not have, and, you know, that's fair. I mean, it's, it's just how the media is today. Oakland A's pitcher Chris Bassett said the Astros were the guinea pig of sign stealing, uh, and that basically that was going on all over the place, and felt that you made a example of them and turned a blind eye to sign stealing going on with other teams. Is that a fair criticism? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, remember, lead before the Astros situation came up, we went through a number of investigations where we identified problems. 
um, changed rules, uh, put monitors in place in order to address the issue. Um, the Astros situation was thoroughly investigated and, you know, whether they were disciplined. I don't necessarily think of it as made an example of, but they were disciplined. We had follow-up allegations that were also thoroughly investigated and were unable to uncover evidence that was sufficient to support discipline. Uh, the 2021 All-Star Game moved from Atlanta to Colorado. Were you pressured by anyone to make that decision? No. There was a lot of lobbying, was there Look, not? People had, I accepted input from a variety of places. Um, I, I understood a variety of problems that were gonna be caused by being in Atlanta. At the end of the day, it was my decision and my responsibility. If you had to make the decision today, would you make the same decision? With the facts that existed at that point in time, I think it would make the same decision um, I have to say, um, you know, we've now been through an election cycle in, in Georgia. Um, I'm glad there was big voter turnout. Um, I know some people will say that proves that you were worried about nothing. You know, I think the other way you look at it is maybe we brought attention to an issue that people turned out in bigger numbers because of that attention. I don't know what the answer is. I, 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 I do think that in the same context, I'd make the same decision. Really, people have said that, obviously, because the turnout was so spectacular that perhaps the characterization of the law was not accurate. What, what do you say to that criticism? I, I, it may, it, maybe that's right. But it's equally plausible that the attention that was brought to the issue galvanized people to turn out in numbers. I don't know which one's right. Um, I am glad that people turned out in numbers. I think that's an important thing.